Well, good morning. Thanks again, Cody, for not being selfish with your podium, with your pulpit. And I love the chance to teach. I'm going to be in Colossians chapter 2. Cody's been teaching a series through John. I asked him if I could pick up where he left off, and he said no. Because <laughs> he wants to teach Jesus walking on the water. That'll be next week. But since the theme has been all about Jesus, I'm going to show you the Apostle Paul's real heartbeat for the church at Colossae. And it, it centers on the preeminence of Jesus. But first, I want to start with some deep thoughts. Have you ever heard the, the imponderable question, if a tree falls in the forest and no one is there to hear, does it really make a sound? David Haldaway asks some other imponderable questions. He says, is there another word for synonym? <laughs> he asks, why don't sheep shrink when it rains? <laughs> In this culture, what are you going to do when you see an endangered animal eating an endangered plant? Here's a good one. Why do they lock gas station restrooms? Are they afraid someone will clean them? <laughs> and this is my favorite. If you try to fail and succeed, which have you done? <laughs> and when my uh, youngest was growing up, she had a friend in the fifth grade who, at the dinner table, seriously looked me in the eye, and she said... Pastor Mark, I want to know this question. I've been thinking about it a lot. If a man talks in the forest and there's no woman there to hear him, <laughs> is he still wrong? <laughs> the first time I told that joke, my wife said, I never want to hear that again. <laughs> She's not here today. All right, Colossae, a very uh, insignificant town as time went on, but when it started, it was 110 miles inland from Ephesus on a very important trade route, right up the Lycos River on the Lycos Valley, and so it began to grow and was uh, quite prominent. A large community of Jewish settlers came there as well as eastern traders, because the trade route went to, on into Asia. But then a little town came south of them, 10 miles, named Laodicea. Perhaps you've read about that in your Bibles. Well, Laodicea, being more modern, um, attracted all of the business. And it was like the freeway went around Colossae, and it began to fall into decline. The Apostle Paul never visited Colossae, but had heard of their faith. Epaphras had visited Paul while he was in prison. Epaphras was just a guy, a working guy who had met Jesus and had carried that message back to his hometown. That's the way it works. You don't need an evangelist. You don't need a pastor. You just need somebody whose heart's on fire for Jesus to share with their neighbors about the love that Jesus gives and the forgiveness that we find in him. And a church sprang up around that message. Epaphras, though, was there long enough to be able to see that church start having some problems. It was a cultural problem. You see, they had been infiltrated by some converts that were still Jewish, obviously, had embraced Jesus, but brought with them all of their ritualism and legalism, and were teaching people that it's great to believe in Jesus, but... You need to make sure that you're this and you're that and that you don't and that you do. And they had added to Jesus all of these rules and rituals and routines. Along with that, the Greek culture around that area had infiltrated with this great philosophy. The Greeks were famous and many philosophers that you guys studied in college came out of that time period. And a philosopher, as you know, begins to approach life saying, what do I know and why do I know it and what can I learn about my world around me? 
But he soon finds that there's a lot he can't know as a philosopher, if he's, if he's honest. And yet some of those philosophers would hear the message of Jesus and Christianity, and they would like some of the tenets about love and about family and about treating people with respect and about being beneficial to the culture that you're in. And they would embrace, and they still do, by the way, embrace certain tenets of Christianity, but their philosophical abstractions still remain the center part of how they view their life. And so Jesus, though he's present, is a shadow. He's on the periphery. Acknowledged, but not loved. Present, but not devotion. Not, there's no heart. And then there was that whole Eastern mysticism that had come into the church at that time through a group known as the Gnostics. Now, the Greek word for no is Gnosis. I don't know if they pronounced the, to pronounce the G or if the G is silence, but it's G-N-O-S-I-S, Gnosis. These individuals believed somehow esoterically that God couldn't have been in touch with material because material world is evil. It decays, it rots, animals eat animals, trees die, people develop diseases. And so they had developed this idea that in order for God to be truly God... He needed to be separate from his creation. And so they came up with this philosophy that there were several emanations from God, angels, spirit beings, and down, and even Jesus was one of those manifestations. They did not believe that Jesus had a literal body, but that he came as a spiritual representation of God, not God himself, but a representation of God. And the way that they attracted people was this idea that if you fully experienced God through a spirit guide or through a, a guided imagery or through an, an emotional experience, that you could find the fullness of God without Jesus. So Paul wrote this letter to combat those three errors. Legalism, ritualism, Eastern mysticism, that whole idea of that you can experience God through a spirit guide or, or through meditation or, or through some kind, of, even drugs can introduce you to this spiritual dimension, out of body, disassociation of your mind. So in chapter one, Paul writes this incredible dissertation after praying for them, and it's a powerful prayer in chapter one. And then he ends chapter one with this litany of who Jesus is. He's the creator. He's the redeemer. He's all in all. Everything that God is, Jesus is because Jesus is God. And then he starts chapter two this way. Do you have your Bible? Colossians chapter two, verse number one. The apostle said, I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea. And for as many as, have, has, as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all, and that little word is what? All, A-L-L, -L, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I'm absent in the flesh, yet I'm with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order, the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as you've been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells, what's that word? All the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him who is the head of what? All principality and power. Powerful stuff. 
He goes on to very specifically address those three errors that were prolific in the church at the time, empty ritualism, showy mysticism, and worthless asceticism. You see, the flip side of the Gnostics who believed that this world was material, therefore evil, there were two basic ways of responding to that in their understanding. One was to try to disassociate everything you can from this world. Taste not, touch not, be ascetic. Give up this, give up that, separate from, join a monastery. You know, you don't, you don't, you don't. And then the more popular one was, since the material world is evil and you are spirit, then you can do all the evil stuff you want because it's evil and it's because it's material, but your spirit stays pure. And you can imagine why that one was more popular. <laughs> right? Right. All right. So these 10 verses, I think, have two very powerful principles to teach us today. Um, let's be honest. Are any of those philosophies around today, legalism? Have you ever heard anything about legalism, rule keeping, where you got to do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that, where all of a sudden, if you're really sincere, you either get proud because you succeed or you feel shame because you can't, and in either way, Jesus takes a back seat. Any emphasis on um, New Age spiritual mysticism, guided imagery, spirit guides, astrology? Any, any, anybody still believe that stuff today? Yeah? Is there any tendency to just kind of either be worldly and say, you know, it doesn't matter as long as my spirit is forgiven. I ask Jesus in my heart. I'm going to heaven when I die. Therefore, it doesn't really matter how I live. Anybody you ever known anybody that had that kind of an attitude? I have met a guy in talent who says, Pastor, I, I just got to be honest with you. The way I view life is Jesus made me a sinner, and I don't want to disappoint him. He's a good, I'm a good sinner, and he's a good savior. It's, we got a deal going. It's, it's prevalent today. So two things I want you to hear, and you can write these down. They have each several points underneath them, because if you've ever heard me teach, I, I, I never want to teach a pointless sermon. One, the fullness we seek is in Jesus. We all hunger for fullness. When Nick Vujicic, the armless, legless evangelist, stood on this stage, you know, his table, and we had him down at the high school, and he said the same thing down at the high school gymnasium. He said this fullness is like that moment when you go, He said, you, ha you wanted it when you were in kindergarten. And then in high school. And still as an adult. And as an old person. Where's, where is he? And as an old person, I still find myself all these years later longing for... You ever heard of Google Earth? I have a spot that I visit from Google Earth. It's in Hawaii. <laughs> I spent many an hour on that little beach. And sometimes when I'm really, really frustrated with life and with you, I open up Google Earth and I zero in on that little beach and I go, but it doesn't work. <laughs> so I don't think I'm alone. In fact, I know I'm not alone. That in the human heart, there is this longing for fullness, for completeness, for knowing deeply, viscerally, that everything's okay. Where are you going to go to get that? Point number one is, all the fullness we seek is in Jesus. And I'm going to develop that and show you why. The second major point is that if we're going to avoid the emptiness of false philosophy, we need to be on guard. 
And Paul gives us in the same 10 verses some very clear, actionable verses, principles that will guard us, you and me, against falling prey to the distractions and to the philosophies and to the emptiness of the culture that we live in. So let's go through first these 10 verses and kind of break them down. First, we're going to focus on that first question of where are we going to find fullness, and the answer is in Jesus. But look how Paul starts this. He said, I want you to know what a great conflict, and that word is agon in the Greek, from which we get the word agony. It really is the name of the first place that they held the Olympics, and the wrestling match was called agonia. You're, you weren't a wrestler, you're a baseball player. I heard you say last week. Any wrestlers in the, in the group? Painful sport, isn't it? No pain, no gain. Paul said, I have this great agony, this great, this intense struggle for you. I've never met you, but I have this intense struggle for you. Well, what was his main struggle? He said, I want, verse 2, I want their hearts to be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining or, or finding and getting to the place where all the riches and full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of God, of the Father, and of Christ. Let's just stop there for a moment. All the fullness we seek is in Jesus. The Apostle Paul makes a very dogmatic claim, but can he back it up? All the mysteries of God, he declares, are revealed in Jesus. You want to know the mysteries of God? Study Jesus. You want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus. You want to experience the fullness of God? Then experience Jesus. Focus your heart and your mind on Jesus. The New International Version translates verse 2 this way. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart, united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they might know the mystery of God Namely, Christ. Everything there is to know about God is revealed in Jesus. So to know Christ is to know God. To hear Christ is to hear God. So when someone comes and tries to tell you that there are places to learn about God besides Jesus, what do you say to them? You could do it nicely and say, nay, nay. Or you could say, (laughs) no, this is a statement. Now, whether you've experienced it or not or not, that's that's debatable. And that is, you know, personally, that's for you to decide. But the dogmatic statement is, if you know Jesus fully, then you know God fully. And if you know God fully, you know all the mysteries there is to know. Now, here's what's funny about that. We will never, a million years from now, fully understand God. He is unknowable in the sense of being able to fully comprehend and put your puny human mind around all God is. But what we do about, know about him continues to blow my mind. Amen? When I understand his grace, it, it, it just mystifies me. Not because of the one who gives it, but because of the people to whom he gives it. That alone mystifies me. The old timers said that God would love a sinner such as I. How could it happen? How could it happen? And it goes on and on and on. We don't know everything about God, but everything there is to know about God is found in Jesus. Look at verse 3 again. All the wisdom and knowledge, all wisdom and knowledge, not just spiritual wisdom and knowledge, all wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ. With this fullness that you're hungry for, where are you going to go to find it? Chick fil A? In and out? What's your favorite? I mean, what gives you that? (sighs) It's temporary, isn't it? In your spirit. So what we understand is that there's no other source of true wisdom. It's not a philosophy book. 
It's not in, in some you know, guru's teachings. It's not in some swami that can tell me that. It's not in studying the stars and wondering how all of that fits together and, and trying to see that this astrology report fits you know, my prognication of the day and all of that. There's no other source for true knowledge. So if someone comes and tries to tell us that wisdom can be found outside of Jesus, we know better. We know better. Look at verses 5 through 7. Paul said, though I'm absent in the flesh, I'm with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order. And what is the next phrase? And the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, rooted. That's anchored. Built up in him. That's stable. And established. All of those imply this stability of life. You're not blown about. You're not rocked by the world. You're not gone crazy when somebody gets elected you can't stand. That Your world is not rocked by the events of this world because your hope is not in this world. Your hope is in Jesus Christ. Amen? You see how that works? The, the, the source of true stability then, in life and in, in decision-making and in everything, is, is not found in the political situation around me or the, the size of your bank account. Because I can tell you this from meeting a few of them, I know some millionaires that are very insecure people. Their money didn't make them steadfast or satisfied. I mean, it was a long time ago, and some of you haven't even heard his name, but they asked Rockefeller, how much do you need? You already have so much. And he said, just a little more. I mean, that's the way it works. That's the way it works. And so if someone comes and says, you know, in order for you to really be anchored, you need blah, 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 X, Y, Z. If it doesn't have to do with Jesus, it's not true. It's not true. It may be popular, and, and people may give a testimony to how it met their need. They went to this seminar and they experienced this. And so that's where you got to go to find fullness or this new book or this new teacher. They've got this philosophy of life or this enneagram that you need to understand who you are and you live by this thing and, and all of the rest that people do. Those are false philosophies that promise but can't deliver. And God is the source of true stability and only God. When you get rooted, anchored, built up in him, on him, that true foundation that no one can shake. And then in verse 9, I love this verse. I just love it. It's so simple, but it is so profound. For in Jesus, in him, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. All the fullness of God. And fullness is exactly what it implies. This vastness, this completeness, everything there is to have is contained in God. Deity lies in bodily form. The New International Version translate that. Jesus Christ is the completeness of God. He's the fullness of God. There's nothing lacking in Jesus. So if you have Jesus, you have all of God you're ever going to have and all of God you're ever going to need. So if someone comes and tries to tell us that we need something more than Jesus, we know better. Warren Wiersbe said he was going through an airport and a guy dressed kind of strangely came up to him and tried to sell him a book. Now, this is before many of your time, but that used to happen quite frequently back in the 80s, 70s and 80s. And they were saying, we believe in Jesus, but you need this also. There are others who would say, well, yes, the New Testament is true, but there's another testament that was written about North America and you, you need the, the Old Testament and the, and the Bible, but you also need the fullness of understanding that came through an angel. Ring a bell? And what do we say? No, wait, 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 wait. Nay, nay. All the fullness of God dwells in Jesus. Jesus. The Jesus of the Bible. And then watch this capstone. Read verse 10 again, wouldn't you? Look at it. Just look at it. And you 
are, what's that? Complete. Now don't, you can't say that without saying the two, the little, pro, a little you know, preposition after. You are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. You are complete. 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 We're complete. In Christ Jesus, I lack nothing. Now, I have a tendency, and I always have, and I don't know where it came from. My father was insecure. Maybe he passed it DNA to me. I don't know. But I tend to be very introspective. I'm a shame attractor. And I found that this world is full of shame givers. People that tell you you should do this and you should do that and you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't feel that and you shouldn't be depressed and you shouldn't struggle and you shouldn't doubt and you shouldn't be sad. And, and I, you know, I've just... Uh, Christians are so good at shooting on each other, aren't they? <laughs> and I'm so good at attracting it. And I just, I, and my journals are filled with, oh, I failed again, and I'm disappointed, and God must just be so impatient with me. <laughs> and then I read, and you are complete in him. When God looks at me through the blood of Jesus Christ, he doesn't see my inadequacies. He doesn't see my failures. He doesn't see my humanness, my insecurity, my depression, my foibles, my weirdness, my idiosyncrasies. He, he, he doesn't see that I'm 40 pounds overweight. He doesn't care. He's got a new body for me that's six six and deep baritone voice. <laughs> I'm complete. I'm complete in him and in him alone. And so when I'm tempted to look at self-effort and self-improvement and I got to do better and I got to feel better about myself, that is a dead-end road. And so I come full circle back to the, the fullness that I seek is in Jesus. It's in Jesus. It's in Jesus. What are you hungry for? I can tell you where the, the deep fullness that you genuinely are seeking is not in astrology and it's not in some experience and it's not on a little beach in Hawaii. The fullness that you seek is in Jesus. So all this philosophy that surrounds us and this cultural upheaval that is perpetual, it's been around since Adam, we have a culture that infect, infects and affects us. How are we going to avoid those pitfalls? Well, Paul gives us in these same 10 verses some very clear principles. So let's go back to verse 2 and, and list, lift them out. Paul said, I, I want you to know I have this great conflict that their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love. Now, there's two principles there. I read them together. But it's critical to understand that when you begin to understand who Jesus is and how accessible Jesus is and how wonderful Jesus is and how complete you are in him because of what he did, not because of what you do, how consistent you are, how faithful you are, how compassionate you are, how sincere you are. It's all about how faithful he was and how dedicated he was to the plan of salvation. And he finished it. So be encouraged. I can tell you this, just from um, 66 and a half years of living. I'm old, one of those old people. <laughs> um, a discouraged heart is the devil's playground. I mean, if he can get you discouraged, oh, why did that happen? It just keeps happening. It just keeps happening. Have you ever noticed that problems come in dozens? And sometimes when you let yourself, you begin to say, man, this doesn't feel very good. I thought God loved me. And the devil says, well, if he really loved you, then you wouldn't have all these problems. And I want you to understand, that's not biblical. 
Man's days on earth are short and full of trouble. We live in a fallen world, in a fallen body. And until we're out of this world, we are going to face problems. In fact, you live with one. (laughs) Am I wrong? So where are you going to find encouragement? If you look for it in your circumstances, your life is going to be like this. That's why we use the word happiness. Happiness is based on what happens. And when things are happy, you can be happiness. You can have happiness. But here's the thing about contentment. Contentment, godliness and contentment is great gain, we're told in the scriptures. And when you're content in Jesus, it doesn't matter what storms come, what problems come, because you know at the base of all things, your soul is secure, your eternity is settled, Your sins are forgiven. You have the Holy Spirit who lives in you. You are never alone, and you will never face anything that God can't handle. I hate it when people say, God will never put on you any more than you can handle. Baloney. You can't handle very much. You might handle more than I can, but you can't handle very much. But I can tell you, God can handle everything. Be encouraged. But he he connects that with the next principle. He wants them to be knit together in love. Did you, do you understand the importance of the family of God for this whole thing of staying away from false deceit and false philosophies and the cultural craziness? We need each other. We need each other desperately. You need the family of God. And our culture from the very birth teaches us to be independent, to be strong, to to take care of yourself, to be a man, to man up and handle your problems. But the, the, the church of Jesus Christ was founded to be a family of people who come together, not in perfection, but in weakness to support and love and encourage and, and challenge and correct and pray for. You need someone who can pray for you when you're discouraged. And you need to be able to pray for others when they're discouraged. You know, when I first started coming to this church back in the late 90s, one of the things that just impressed me was how often I'd walk around and see people just with their hand on each other's shoulder praying. Just praying. I mean, we're not talking about pastors. We're just talking about people. You saw it. You You guys... I mean, it was kind of a, a cultural thing that just happened around here. Um, when you would be sharing with someone, oh, yeah, man, I just got fired from work. Someone, instead of just saying, man, that sucks, they'd say, hey, let's just pray about it. And they just put their hand on your shoulder and begin to pray. You know how powerful that is? We need each other. Don't be a Lone Ranger Christian. If, if you haven't found a fellowship, this would be a great one. Just jump in. Become a part. And let us get to know you. Um, I mean, granted, we've got some stories here, and some of them are pretty spotty. So you'll fit right in. (laughs) We need the family of God. So those two principles, be encouraged, be united in love. And then look at verse 4. Verse 4 says this, I say this lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. We, We need to be careful... Not to be deceived by someone's, you know, pathos or their enthusiasm or their delivery or what you think is the key to life that they've discovered. And the way to do that is to take everything you hear, everything you see, and bring it back to the litmus test of, is it about Jesus? Does it bring about devotion to Jesus? Does it help me fall deeper in love with Jesus? And if not, no thank you. It's not what I need. Christ is not only my guide, he's my gauge. It's about Jesus. It's from Jesus. It's for Jesus. It's with Jesus. It's to Jesus. Paul would tell the the Romans this, this philosophy of life, for of him and through him and to him are all things. It comes from God, goes through us back to God. That's the way to live a life that matters. And then look at verse 6 and 7. I love this. It's so practical. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Rooted, built up in him, established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Let's just talk about growing deeper in Christ. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord. How many in here drive stick? 
Not very many. How many of you here don't know how to drive stick? Ah, I'm sad for you. Because this illustration won't mean anything to you. Well, when I was 15, you could drive at 14 in Idaho at the time. I had my license, and at 15, I had my first car. It cost me 60 bucks. <laughs> Little VW with all the seats ratted and tatted. It was rusted out. And I had to learn to drive stick. And here's how it works. In that little bug, you'd push in the clutch, shift into first gear, release the clutch slowly as you put a little gas, and... <laughs> right? And, and then, if you wanted to go a little faster, you had to engage the clutch, put it into second, right? All right, now here's what happens. When I come to a stop sign, what do I do? I do, I go back in. Now, the why do I say that? As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. It's just basic, basic physics, all right? If I want to get my sh stick car to move, I've got it. I can't start in fourth. Well, I guess I could. I'd burn my clutch out. I put it in first, disengage the clutch, move forward. And when I hit a stop sign, I start over and do the whole thing. As you have received Christ Jesus. Let's take that silly little analogy and apply it. How did you receive Christ Jesus? You re if you received him at all, it's the same way I did. By faith, not by works. I didn't deserve it. Didn't merit it. Came to recognize myself as a sinner. Him as a perfect savior. I said, Lord, save me. All right. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus, so walk in him. So I coming through life, I'm a Christian now, but I face a stop sign. I, may, I fail. I fall flat on my face in sin. What do I do? Well, I put it in first. I disengage the clutch and I say, oh God, forgive me. As you forgave me, you've already forgiven me. I just, and I get back up and I move forward until I hit the next stop sign. And then I do it again, and then I do it again, and then I do it again, until finally I hear the trumpet call or the, the, you know, the, the funeral guy throws dirt in my face, and I go to heaven, right? And then I don't have to drive anymore. <laughs> As you have received Christ Jesus, so walk in him. And then he says, built up in him. Put down some roots. How's your devotional life? I mean, do you read? Do you, do you read the Bible? Do you think about Jesus? Have you, have you learned to think and meditate as you drive instead of just listening to crazy music? They put a new radio in my bus. Kids were excited. I'm driving along and I'm going, I'm hearing stuff I'd never heard before. What the heck is that? I went home and asked my wife. She got her Google out and she says, Mark, you don't want to listen to that station. And I go, oh, Okay. You, 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 can't, you can't let this culture be your guide. You've got to put down some roots and learn how to meditate and learn how to think and, and, and learn how to think spiritually, learn how to think biblically, learn how to dis, you know, discern what's coming at you through the news and through the media and through you know, your well-meaning friends at the gym. Build your life on Jesus. And he ends that little thing by saying abounding with thanksgiving. You know, I heard... Uh, I heard a man say once that he'd never met a grateful, depressed person. And I thought about that. When I am deep in my depression, gratitude has taken a hike. But when I can look around and say, oh, wow, <laughs> look at all how God's blessed me. Am I living on that beach in Hawaii? No. But man, I've got more than enough I ate three squares plus yesterday. Right? Amen. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> and he ends again with the same principle that we saw in this fullness in Jesus. You are complete in him. Stop measuring yourself by another Christian. Stop trying to, to be your best self. Trying sets you up. What God desires us to do is trust. Trust. Trying will either make you proud 
which will result in being hypercritical of others and snooty and holier than thou. And, and I hate those kind of people, don't you? They're hard to be around. Really hard. But it also, flip side, trying will set you up if you don't succeed for feeling like, oh, I can never be a good Christian or I just can't get this spiritual stuff or I just can't do this. It's just not, I don't have it. That's what you get when you focus on you. Here's what you get when you focus on Jesus. He is everything. He's done everything. I'm complete in him. He has accepted me. He loves me as I am. He is with me nonstop. And when I fail, he doesn't say, what's the matter with you? He has anticipated it, and he is there to pick me up, dust me off, hold me tight, and walk with me through this life. You are complete in him. So, dear Christian, I don't know what it is that's messing with you, what distraction has taken your eyes off Jesus, but there's a plethora of them out there, aren't there? Problems and oncology reports and the death of a daughter and, and uh, the elections coming up and, and your neighbor's dog. And, and uh, I mean, there's a million. There's a million that take our distractions, take our minds off of Jesus. And I think maybe the reason God sent you here today is to have both the worship set, which I thought was fun and, and I thought also very in inspiring, and then the teaching and, and the communion at the end we're going to do. Listen, it begins and ends with Jesus. 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 In fact, let's just stop and let's just sing that old song, all right? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Close your eyes. Sing it with me again. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Verse 1 of that old song says, O soul, are you weary? And troubled, no light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant and free. So, one more time. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace and if you never met Jesus or if you've been searching for something and you just can't seem to find it and whatever you find, it satisfies for a second and then it dissipates. Listen, I can tell you this, that the, the heart is incomplete until it finds its fullness in Jesus. He died so that you could have forgiveness. He died so that you could be accepted into his family. He died and rose again so that you could have the Holy Spirit in you to live with you, to empower you, to accompany you, to comfort you, to help you. And then when you die, to transport your spirit instantly into the very presence of Jesus himself. Father, thank you for Jesus. Now how our hearts are warmed when we just stop and think about Jesus. I pray that you would deepen, as we sang a moment again, our thirst for you, our desire to seek you 
even though we found you, to continue to seek you for your fullness, for your, the mystery that's in you of God and all of the riches that are found in you. Lord, help us to again understand where the source is and come back to that water that you said to the woman would spring up within her, that water that would satisfy. And, and Lord, we know that, that that's you. So if there is somebody here that doesn't know you, would you draw them to yourself? Would you show them how deeply you love them personally and passionately? And I pray for every distracted Christian, every discouraged Christian, that you would again lift their eyes off of their circumstances and off of themselves and place them firmly upon the one who is always available, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Thank you for loving us. You're a good God, and we're so grateful to be your kids. In Jesus' name, amen.